Amen. Shall we continue to worship? If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 18. Matthew, chapter 18. And it has been so good to be here with you all these last two days. And uh, I have been nourished. I thank you to the men who have spoken before, or who have spoken before, and uh, how you have prepared for us a feast from the Word. And uh, we have eaten of it, and you have nourished our souls, and I thank you all for that. Um, We are here at a conference talking about love. Love is the great thing. Uh, I wanted to share something with you. I go to church with a bunch of sinners. And uh, we need to kind of figure out what happens if you go to a church where there's a lot of sinners? How do you love those people? Because here's the deal. If you go to a church where there's sinners, like I do, they are going to sin against you. And then they're going to commit sins, not against you, but ripple into your life. And that's hard to deal with. How do you love one another in a context like that? And so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at Matthew chapter 18. And we're going to try and see how do we love sinners in this way that the Lord Jesus Christ is bringing out for us in Matthew chapter 18. So if you were there in Matthew chapter 18, I'm starting in verse 15. And listen to what Jesus says. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Between you and him alone, if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there there am I among them. Let's begin this time with a word of prayer to the Lord our God. Our Father God, we come before you in this time and we are going to confess to you, Lord, that our minds oftentimes are not ready to hear your word. Our thoughts are oftentimes scattered. Lord, apart from your spirit, we would receive none of your word. So we ask that in this time, you would send forth your spirit into our midst. Lord, we ask that the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ would open this word up to us, give us these words of life, plant them deep in our hearts that they might show us our wretchedness, our sinfulness, that they would cause us to mourn And then we ask that the the Holy Spirit would do his work to exalt Christ before us, that we would see him high and exalted, and in confessing our sins, we would cling to the Lord Jesus Christ for forgiveness, for cleansing, and for transformation. Lord, we do not want to come out of this place as just hearers of your word. We want to come out as obeyers, as those who put it into practice. So we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would do this work amongst us. We greatly need it. We ask that you would do your work of exalting Christ before us. And we ask this in the authority of his name. Amen. Well, I I usually start my sermons off with a little story, and I don't know if you 
realize this, but we are coming up on the 20th anniversary of the famous home run record chase between Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa. I don't, I don't mean to depress some of you, but believe it or not, that happened 20 years ago in the 1998 baseball season. Now, when I came here yesterday and we uh, started our services, I, I, re- I realized there are a lot of people in here who are not even yet 20 years old. So let me give you a little uh, background behind what happened at that point. Uh, in the year 1961, a guy by the name of Roger Maris set the single season home run record in Major League Baseball when he hit 61 home runs in that 1961 season. And that record of 61 home runs in one season stood for almost 40 years. 37 years later in the year 1998, two guys, Mark McGuire, who was a St. Louis Cardinals baseball player, and Sammy Sosa, who, believe it or not, was a Chicago Cub, were in a chase for this home run record. And they ended the season... Mark McGuire ended the season with 70 home runs and Sammy Sosa ended it with 66. Now, that whole time, that season of baseball, there was just a lot of amazing things happening. Not only did you have two guys in the same season going for this near 40-year-old record, they didn't just surpass that record, they smashed that record. And then, believe it or not, the very next season, those same two guys surpassed that mark of 61 home runs again. In the 1999 season, McGuire hit 65 home runs and Sammy Sosa hit 63 home runs. It was crazy. And then, I've got more for you. Two seasons after that, okay? So we're talking about three seasons after Mark McGuire had set a new record over one that had stood for 37 years, three seasons after he set that record, a guy by the name of Barry Bonds comes along and hits 73 home runs. Well, we all know now what was going on. They were cheating. They were using performance-enhancing drugs. And... It was so bad, they weren't the only guys doing it. It was so bad that the national media has dubbed that the steroid era. A lot of records fell. And it's almost like you have to put an asterisk by every one of those records that fell during that time because you don't know if the guy was cheating using performance enhancing drugs or not. And during that time, Major League Baseball wasn't doing really much to crack down on the use of PEDs. They had no league-wide testing. Those three guys that broke those home run records, none of them were ever disciplined. Their records still stand today in the record books. However, in about the year 2003, Congress started to get involved, and the owners of Major League Baseball did not want Congress regulating baseball. And so they decided to uh, crack down on the use of PEDs in baseball. And so they started instituting a league-wide drug testing, and then they instituted a disciplinary plan of action. If any player in Major League Baseball tested positive for PEDs, they would receive a 50-game suspension without pay. Strike one. If it happened again, if a player tested for positive for performance-enhancing drugs again, then they would receive a 100-game suspension without pay, strike two. If it happened a third time, according to this disciplinary, disciplinary plan of action, strike three, you're out, you're kicked out of baseball for life. You received a lifetime ban from the game of baseball. Now, since they instituted this disciplinary plan of action, the home run totals have gone way down. And To my knowledge, only one player has tested positive three times. That was in 2016, and he was banned from baseball, from Major League Baseball for life. 
Now, the reason I bring that up is when we come to our passage right here in Matthew chapter 18, it looks as if Jesus seems to be advocating a similar three strikes and you're out disciplinary plan of action for the members of his church. In fact, when people come to this passage, they refer to this process as church discipline. Now, here's the deal. When people hear the word discipline, as Terry brought up, what do you think of? I'm a parent. I think of spanking. All right. Now you put the word church in front of it. <laughs> Was you recreating on the Sabbath? That's the sound of a ruler being wrapped upon some knuckles. They start thinking of spiritual spankings. This is how the church spanks people who are caught sinning. Other people, when they hear the term church discipline, kind of associate it with kicking people out of the church. Church discipline is the process that you follow when you need to excommunicate somebody from the church. Now, whenever I teach about church discipline, oftentimes people want to know, well, what is loving about church discipline? And I've had people from my church ask me, when someone is dealing with sin, wouldn't it not be better to just love on them isn't this what they need, love? And isn't this what we are commanded to do is to love? Well, here's the thing. When we come to our passage here in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 through 20, this isn't something really that Jesus is advocating for. He is commanding it. And if we are a people in submission to the reign and rule of the Lord Jesus Christ, we dare not rebel against his commands. And so here's the question we really need to ask when we come to this. Since we are commanded to practice church discipline, how do we love one another in this practice? Let me repeat that again. This is what we're driving at tonight or this afternoon. Since we are commanded to practice church discipline, how do we love one another in this practice? Well, in order to answer this question, I've set a course for us. The first thing we are going to do is we are going to look at the context of the passage. We're going to study the context of the passage to understand what's being communicated at the beginning. And then after we've studied the context, we're going to look at what church discipline really is. So we're going to study our passage even more so now that we've got the context of the passage. And in doing this, hopefully it will help us learn how we can love one another through this process called church discipline. So let's begin with the context of the passage. And I think the best way to do that is to start at the very beginning of the chapter, chapter 18, starting in verse one. Listen to these words. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom? Now we want to ask, why, why would they ask a question like this? And what's the mindset behind this question? If you go to chapter 16, Jesus speaks very favorably to Simon Peter. He asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus singles out Simon Peter and he says, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And then he says, you are Peter, the rock. Upon this rock, I will build my church. And he says, I will give the keys of the kingdom to you. And that, that word in Greek is singular, to you, singular Peter. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Speaking very favorably to Peter in the midst of all the disciples there in chapter 16. Then when you get to chapter 17, Jesus is acting very favorably to Peter. He invites Peter and James and John up to a mountain where he is transformed before them. They see the fullness of the glory of Jesus. And then he tells them, don't tell anybody about this until I'm raised from the dead. And he gives them very privileged information. So you can imagine the other disciples seeing Jesus's favorable speech toward Peter, his favorable actions toward Peter, James, and John, and kind of wondering, well, how do I get to that point? How do I get there? 
So you can maybe see where this question comes up. Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom? In other words, Jesus, what do I need to do to find a favorable position in the kingdom of heaven? What, what, if I'm already there, what is it that I did? How do I put myself into a favorable position? And the, the mindset behind this is they're placing confidence in themselves that they can earn a high place in the kingdom. And then listen to what comes next, verses two through four. And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of, the, of them and said, truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus answers their question by just shattering their misplaced confidence. Don't even think this way, because if you do, forget about finding a place in the kingdom. You won't even get into the kingdom. And he tells them, you need to repent. He says, turn, let's repent. You need to repent of this. This is what you need to understand. The greatest in the kingdom will be like a child. Well, what does that mean? The greatest in the kingdom will be like a child. I have eight kids. I'll tell you what, it means that children, first of all, we need to understand, are helpless and hopeless. They are weak, feeble, frail, even at 13 years old, they need you to do stuff for them. They need you to feed them, to clothe them, to give them shelter, to give them protection. They need you to teach them, to instruct them, to discipline them, even if they don't want it. Without me... They have none of those things. Without me and my wife, my kids have absolutely none of those things. And so what Jesus is trying to tell his disciples, what he's trying to teach them is that they, like children, are in need of him. They are in need of God the Father for everything. They are weak, feeble frail. Forget about standing in the kingdom. They need him for entrance into the kingdom. The Bible says, if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? That's you. That's me. We need Christ for everything. And so Jesus' true disciples will see that they, like children, are weak, feeble, and frail, not just physically, but spiritually. Do you see yourself this way? You are weak, feeble, frail. Not just physically, but spiritually. Do you see yourselves this way? You see, this is something that Jesus actually taught his disciples earlier in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5 at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. The very first portion of the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, he begins with this. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That is, blessed are those who recognize that they are spiritually bankrupt. They have nothing. They bring nothing to the table. But when they realize that, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he goes on to say, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who, when they see their weakness before God, their spiritual bankruptcy, that they are bringing nothing to him, it grieves them. It causes them to mourn. But when they grieve and mourn, it says they will be comforted. And then what does he say after that? Blessed are the meek. Those who, when they recognize they are spiritually bankrupt, they are feeble, frail, they offer nothing to Christ, and it causes them to grieve and it causes them to mourn, that's going to make them humble. This is what Jesus is advocating here, that they be humble. What happens to those people? They shall inherit the earth. This is how Jesus' true disciples should view themselves like helpless, hopeless children, totally dependent upon their God. And then look with me at verses five through six. 
Jesus says, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me, so we're talking about a disciple, to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned into the depth, in the depths of the sea. I want you to follow the, the flow of Jesus' teaching, where he's trying to bring his disciples in this teaching. If Jesus' disciples know that they are weak, feeble, and frail, both physically and spiritually, then that means Jesus' disciples, like a child, are going to be very prone, very vulnerable to sin and temptation, especially new believers. They are going to be beset by all kinds of temptation to fall into sin. Look with me at verses seven through nine. It's carrying this thought forward. Woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. So what this passage is communicating is, yes, it's a a way for us to radically deal with sin, but the implication behind his teaching here in verses seven through nine is the temptations that are going to beset his little ones are going to come not only from the world, but from within themselves, from their body and from their own minds. And so Jesus's true disciples, like these little ones, They're going to struggle with sin and temptation. This is a reality for them. This is what makes them needy like children. Jesus' disciples are in great need of their God, not only to protect them from sin and temptation, but when they fall into sin and temptation, to deliver them from sin and temptation. Look with me at verses 10 through 14. Jesus goes on. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. So you notice the the thought is continuing. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, He rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of my father who is in heaven that one of little ones go with sin and temptation. Don't despise them. Now, right now, we need to ask the question, if God is our father, would he allow us to struggle with sin and temptation? Would he allow us to fall into sin and temptation? I wanted to read for you a passage from the Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689. This is from chapter five on divine providence. And this is paragraph five. And listen to these words. This is, these are the words of not just one man, but many men coming together to, to write out this doctrine. It says the perfectly wise righteous and gracious God often allows his own children for a time to experience a variety of temptations and the sinfulness of their own hearts. He does this to chastise them for their former sins or to make them aware of the hidden strength of the corruption and deceitfulness of their hearts so that they may be humbled. He does this to lead them to a closer and more constant dependence on him to sustain them, to make them more cautious about all future circumstances that may lead to sin and for other just and holy purposes. So whatever happens to any of his elect happens by his appointment, for his glory, 
and for their good. So yes, God will allow us to follow after the lusts of our heart in order that we can truly see that we are weak, feeble, and frail children and also for us to see that we need him. So the reality is we, we as his little ones are going to struggle with sin. And so Jesus is saying here, when you see that happen, don't despise one of these little ones. In fact, you need to look at their situation from God's perspective. And then we get this parable of the shepherd and the lost sheep. This is a very well-known parable. As I read it, you probably have heard it before. It's recounted in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. And it's a beautiful parable that brings together many metaphors about God and his people found throughout the Bible. Let me just give you a couple of these metaphors that are found in this parable. The first is this. God's people in the Bible are frequently called his sheep his flock. Listen to Psalm 95. It says, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Psalm 103, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. So that metaphor is brought into this parable right here. Another metaphor that we find throughout the Bible is not only does God have a people that he calls his flock, God is referred to as the shepherd of this flock. Think of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Isaiah 40, 11. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. In the New Testament, Jesus is referred to as the good shepherd, John chapter 10. He is referred to as the chief shepherd, 1 Peter 5 and Hebrews 13. That is a metaphor that is brought into this parable. Here is another metaphor. We are told in the Bible that as his flock, his people can go astray. Here's the flock. Some of his people can go astray. Listen to Psalm 119, 76. I have gone astray like a sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. Isaiah 53, this is also echoed in 1 Peter chapter 2. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Why do God's people, why does his flock go astray? We are weak, feeble, frail. And when we go astray, we are actually going astray into a very dangerous place where there is sin, temptation, snares, perils, predators. First Peter 5, your adversary, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Where is he going to find that person to devour? Astray. That metaphor is brought into this parable. But then another metaphor we see throughout the Bible is that when God's people, his flock, go astray from the flock, God as the shepherd will go and he will get them. Look at Ezekiel 34. It says, for thus says the Lord God, behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and I will seek them out. A couple verses later, it says, I will seek the lost. I will bring back the strayed. I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak. That metaphor is brought here into this parable. And so if we could just kind of summarize the context of what we've been looking at, Jesus's true disciples need to understand that they are weak, feeble, and frail. They have hearts that are very prone to sin and and temptation. And at times they can be caught in, in sin and in temptation. And so he says, when that happens, do not despise them. Because God does not despise them. Rather, he goes and he 
rescues them. Think about it from this perspective. I remember one time when I was in middle school and uh, I, I have two older sisters. I was in middle school and they were both in high school and it was one Friday night and my sisters were out on Friday night and I was in, but I had my buddies over. We were having a sleepover and we were eating pizza, popcorn, playing Nintendo all the way to the wee hours of the morning. First generation Nintendo, so that'll date me a little bit, all right? And at some point, my parents put us to bed, you know, so we all went to sleep uh, in the front room uh, in our sleeping bags and such. And I don't know when, that may have been around like 11 o'clock at night, I'm not sure. But at some point later on that night, me and my friends were awakened because my mom and dad were on the phone. The light in the kitchen, which was right next to the family room, was on. And my parents were calling to different houses because one of my sisters had not come home. And they were calling to find out if she was there. Can you imagine how embarrassing that would be to call someone's house at two o'clock in the morning? Is my daughter there? They called one house and those parents had been up too because their daughter was also not at home yet and found out that they were together. So there was hope there. Well, a little bit after they had been making phone calls, the phone rang. My dad answered the phone. It was my sister. She had been out with her friends. She was hoping that my parents would be asleep and she could sneak in past curfew. Didn't happen. And she had found out from some other friends that my parents had been calling around. She was calling. She's like, Dad, I just want you to know I'm okay. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so listen to this. This is what my sister said to my dad. Look, I know I'm in a lot of trouble. So since I'm already in a lot of trouble, I'm going to go ahead and go to breakfast with my friends and then I'll come home. My dad uh, just asked her one question, where are you? And uh, they were at a truck stop, you know, where, where we are, truck stops had diners that are open all hours of the night and they could get food anytime they wanted. So she let him know, I'm at the truck stop. And he said, stay right where you are. I will be there in five minutes to get you and bring you home. And remember, I'm there with my buddies and we're all awake. And one of them turns to me and goes, Dude, your sister is so busted. And of course, as a 10-year-old little brother, I'm like, I know, that's so awesome. Here's the deal. See this from my dad's perspective. Here's my sister. She had gone astray. She was at that point in rebellion to my father's authority over her. And rather than let her continue in that rebellion, he went and he got her and he brought her back. Why did he do that? Because it's his daughter and he loves her. And by going and getting her and bringing her back, that's how, that's how he loved her. When we look here at the parable of the, the shepherd and the sheep, why does God go get his sheep? Because he loves them. And going and getting them is how he loves them. You know, you look at the parable of the shepherd and the sheep, the word love isn't even in that passage, but the concept is clearly there. And so now that we've looked at the context of the passage, we need to now go back to our passage and try to understand what church discipline really is in light of the context. So let's briefly go through the, uh, the, the passage on church discipline. Again, verse 15 told us that you individually are to go to a brother who has sinned. And in this context, it's a brother who has sinned against you. And it says, if he listens to you, you've gained a brother. But if he does not, strike one. You move on to the next step. 
The next step is, outlined in 16 and 17, you gather two or three brothers with you and you go to this brother who has sinned against you. You lay out your case. It's not stated in this passage, but it's implied that if he listens to you, you've gained a brother. But if he does not, strike two. You move on to the next step. It's outlined in verse 17 at the end. This time you take the whole matter before the church. You lay out your case of your brother who has sinned against you. It's not stated in this section, but again, it's implied. If he listens to you, you've gained a brother. But if he does not listen to you, strike three, he's out. You, as Jesus says, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. In other words, you remove him from membership of the church And in so doing, what the church is doing is making a declaration. By your refusal to listen to us, you are demonstrating yourself to be an unbeliever. And so we, as the church, are kicking you out. We are declaring you an unbeliever, someone who is bound for hell. And then in verse 18 through 20, this is a section that's taken out of context very frequently, but... Let me briefly mention it to tie it all together. It's a confirmation that when the church does this with a member, it has the authority and the backing of Christ behind it. When Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Jesus is saying, when you do this, I'm in the midst of you making the same pronouncement, making the same judgment. This isn't the only place that we see this happening. Listen to Paul's words in Titus chapter three. As for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing to do with him. He was obviously warned them the third time. It says, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 actually commands the Corinthian church, the next time you guys meet together, I want you to take this brother who is uh, in unrepentant sexual sin and I want you to kick him out of the church. In fact, he goes so far as to say, hand him over to Satan. Over here in the place of wandering, this is the domain of Satan. Satan. And Paul is saying, take him from your midst and hand him over to that domain. That sounds really harsh. And again, we want to ask the question, how do we love in a situation like this? Because when you look at it, man, it does seem to be like this is spiritual spankings. It does seem to be like the goal here is to kick people out of the church. It seems unloving, but we've just looked at the context of the passage. So let's wed the context of the passage together with our passage and see church discipline for what it really is. Look with me in verse 15. It starts off like this. If your brother sins against you, think about the context. Who's your brother? Your brother is one of these little ones. He's one of these helpless, hopeless children who is easily caught in sin. And when he says, if he sins against you, that means he's presently caught in sin. Your brother is one of these sheep who has gone astray from the flock. He's been deceived, whether it be by the world or by his own lusts and passions, he has been deceived. And remember, he is in a very dangerous place with perils and snares, dangers, predators. What are you to do with a brother like that? Don't despise them. Look what Jesus says. Go and tell him his fault. What is that? That means go after that little one. Go after that wayward sheep. And when you go and when you do that, if he listens to you, you've gained a brother. What does that mean? If he listens to you, it means if he repents, 
if he repents of the sin that took him wayward. And if he does that, that means you've rescued him. You have brought him back from a very dangerous place of sin and death. This, this is what's going on in verses 15 through 20. This is what verses 15 and 20 through 20 is speaking about. Going and getting your brother. Listen to Galatians chapter six. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Don't despise him. Keep, that's not in the text, by the way, I added that, the don't despise him. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. James in chapter five says, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Do we want to know? Here's what church discipline is. It is, as one pastor has put it, a rescue operation. That's what church discipline is, a rescue operation, rescuing one of these little ones, one of these wayward sheep, one of these brothers from the dangers and consequences of their unrepentant sin. And you'll notice this is a persistent rescue operation. If you go and you plead with your brother, return to Christ, repent of your sin, and he doesn't listen to you, then go get some more brothers and go plead with them. Brother, turn from your sin, repent and turn to Christ. If he doesn't listen to you again, get the whole church, get the whole church together and you guys go and you get that brother. Church discipline isn't spiritual spankings. The goal of church discipline is not to kick people out of the church. Yes, that can be the result, but it's not the goal and it's not always the outcome. In fact, oftentimes when churches practice church discipline, the outcome is the rescue of a wayward brother, one of these little ones, a wayward sheep. Think of church discipline like this. There's a YouTube video called Battle at Kruger. That's K-R-U-G-E-R. If you want to go check it out after the service, you can do that. Uh, if, you wanna, if you watch with your kids, kind of turn the volume down because it's, a, it's an exciting video and the people will take the name of the Lord in vain a couple times. But it has about 80, 80 million views. And, you know... Today on YouTube, that's not a lot. There's several videos that have over a billion views, believe it or not. But at one time, this video was in the top 10 most viewed videos on YouTube. It was featured in Time Magazine and National Geographic. And let me just give you a little bit of a background about this video. It was shot in September of 2004 by a guy who was on safari at Kruger National Park. That's a wildlife refuge in South Africa. And the video starts off with this herd of water buffalo that are coming to this watering hole. And it's basically a riverbank. And what they don't see, but what you see <clears throat> as you're watching the video, is as these water buffalo are coming to this watering hole, just over a little embankment is a pride of lions. They don't see the lions, but the lions see them. Pretty soon those lions <coughs> pounce toward that herd and that herd scatters. And in the commotion, you see that one of the lionesses has taken down uh, uh, a water buffalo calf into the water of the river. And when that lioness takes that, water, that calf down, all the lions swarm on that calf and they got their paws on it. And that lioness has her jaws on its throat trying to crush its trachea so that it can kill and immobilize their prey. Well, they're in the river. And you know how cats love water. 
What they're trying to do is immobilize their prey, but then also they're trying to get out of the water. So these lions start clamping their jaws on this calf's neck and start dragging it out of the water. And as they're getting closer and closer to the bank, two crocodiles come up. And one of those crocs latches its jaws onto the leg of this water buffalo calf. And this tug of war ensues. The lions with their jaws clamped around its neck, the crocodile with its jaws clamped on its leg, and eventually the lions win. They pull it out of the water. (coughs) They drag it up onto the shore. It's the Battle of Kruger. However, once they get it on shore, you start to notice that the water buffalo herd is starting to kind of get a little bit of confidence, heading over to the lions, And those lions are not giving up their prey. They got their paws on it. One has its jaws around that calf's throat. You can see that their ears are back. They are not going to give up this prey. Pretty soon some of the bulls try to get in there and they spook one of the lionesses away and she runs off and that bull chases her. They spook another one. Finally, one of the big bulls just goes in horns first knocks one of those lions up into the air, and eventually those lions finally just scatter. And believe it or not, that water buffalo calf gets up and goes right back into the safety of the herd. They rescued that calf. The guy, one of the safari leaders, who you know has been doing that for years, says, I've never seen anything like that before in my entire life life. Church, this is what church discipline looks like. One of your members, a wayward sheep, is caught in sin, deceived by sin and temptation. Whether it be from the world or from themselves, they're caught in sin. They're in a snare of the devil. And in church discipline, the church goes in and rescues them away from sin, back into submission to Christ. I want you to think about our context and what the church is doing. Think again about what God does when his sheep goes astray. He goes after them and brings them back because he loves them. And in doing that, that is how he loves them. You look at this passage on church discipline, you don't see the word love at all, but you see the concept. And he's given us this command. As I have loved you, so you love one another. So through church discipline, the church is imitating God, loving wayward sheep like God loves wayward sheep. And here's something else to think about. Oftentimes, one of the ways that God goes and rescues his sheep is through the church. The church is his tool to bring his wayward sheep back. So we asked the question at the beginning, how do we love one another through church discipline? How do we love on people when we are commanded to practice church discipline on them The question really answers itself. Listen carefully. Church discipline, when understood rightly and practiced correctly, is how you love one another. Let me say that again. Church discipline, when understood rightly and practiced correctly, is how you love one another. I want you to think about our culture that we live in today. When someone is in error, when they are ensnared by deception, (coughs) our world tells them that to love them is to affirm them in their error and deception. In fact, our world says (coughs) to call them out, to implore them to come out of error is to hate them. This is a satanic philosophy that calls evil good and good evil. When in fact the Bible says, 
<coughs> love them by going. In fact, I would argue to not go is to despise them. Church discipline, especially in this culture, is hard. So I want to ask you, <clears throat> do you truly love one another? Do you have a wayward brother or sister that you know? Do you truly love them? Go get them. We don't need much more application. If you want to obey the command of Christ, if you don't want to be just a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word, go get them. Plead with them. Weep for them. Lift them up to the Lord Jesus Christ. Go get them. That is how you love a sinner, a wayward brother. Let's pray. Our Father God, we come before you. And again, Lord, we, we thank you that you have given us a revelation. Lord, without your word, we would be caught by the philosophy of the culture. We wouldn't know how to love one another. <coughs> Lord, <coughs> this is hard. Your command is hard. But Lord, you give grace. Lord, we ask that you would work grace in our life, that we would love our brothers and sisters. We would not despise them, but we would love them, knowing that we are weak, feeble, frail, helpless, hopeless. We can look at them and say, there but for the grace of God go I. <coughs> Lord Jesus, do a work of grace in us. Sharpen us as a tool that you would use the church to go and rescue wayward brothers. Father, we can only do this through you. We ask you for this grace and the authority of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.